this institute and uh, we have more than 400 participants uh, uh, in this discussion, which is really outstanding. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is because we really have an all-star panel. I know a lot of people say that it sounds cliche, uh, but uh, it really does um, apply in this case. Uh, we have an all-star cast, um, people who just know their stuff, have a lot of experience in the issues that we're going to talk about today, uh, including biodefense, uh, bioproliferation, uh, biosecurity, um, and of course, pandemics. Uh, let me start with uh, Jessica Bell. Uh, Jessica is with the uh, Nuclear Threat Initiative, or uh, NTI. She focuses on global health security. Previously, she was in the private sector, uh, and she consulted for a number of U.S. government agencies. Um, I also want to mention that currently she is uh, the manager of the COVID-19 Frontline Guide uh, for local decision makers here in the United States. And uh, we'll hear more about that uh, from her in a few moments. Uh, Asha George is an accomplished uh, academic and a practitioner who specializes uh, in public health security. She runs the Bipartisan Commission on uh, Biodefense, uh, which Asha also will tell us about in a few moments. Uh, she also is a decorated Desert Storm veteran. And uh, Asha, thank you for your service. Uh, Hank Kane is an expert in all things arms control in the Middle East. She's an old friend of mine. Uh, she runs uh, the uh, Middle East Nonproliferation uh, Program at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, which used to be my home. But she also uh, works on a very important project with the UNIDIR, the United Nations um, Institute for Disarmament Research. And that project focuses on, uh, what did you call it, Han, the Twilight Zone? Uh, the Weapons of Mass Destruction Free Zone in the Middle East. Um, and of course, you will mention that uh, uh, project uh, in a few moments. Uh, there's really a lot more to say about uh, the impressive resumes um, and uh, credentials and accomplishments of these uh, three ladies. Uh, but I'll, uh, in the, for the sake of brevity, I will uh, invite you, please, uh, to check out uh, their stories um, on the MEI's website, which is www.mei.edu. Uh, before I say another word, uh, let me just uh, clarify uh, one thing that's important. I think we'll all agree that um, it certainly is worth uh, emphasizing. Uh, we're not having this conversation because we believe that COVID-19 is a deliberate attempt by any country uh, to spread the virus uh, across the world, or if um, it was an attempt to wage biological warfare against anybody, uh, whether it's China, whether it's the U.S. military, uh, Iran. No actor in the world is involved in deliberately uh, spreading this virus, uh, despite the fact that some people, of course, um, and even officials have, have hinted at that. Um, this is, uh, I think we all agree, this is nonsense. This is uh, um, uh, disinformation. Uh, we're simply not going to entertain in this conversation. Uh, and we all know that the Middle East just tends to love conspiracy theories, okay? And we're just also not going to... Um, uh, entertain those in this conversation, at least as they relate to uh, the coronavirus situation uh, right now. What we are going to talk about, uh, what the uh, purpose of this conversation is, that uh, we believe that there are just some lessons to be learned here, right, uh, about the coronavirus situation. Uh, lessons on uh, how the virus has spread, uh, how we've responded uh, to the crisis thus far, and how much cooperation there's been um, uh, around the world to combat it. And my colleagues and I have mentioned that in the synopsis, uh, uh, regional and international efforts to contain COVID-19 can be a roadmap uh, for an approach to counter bioterrorism and biological warfare uh, in the region. Uh, I think we all also agree that the risk of bioterrorism in the region is relatively small, but it's also not zero, right? Because there's just some actors in the region, uh, including terrorists uh, like uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State who have actually expressed an interest in acquiring uh, such pathogens, and I'm going to take a wild guess that they've actually tried very hard to acquire them, though luckily for now without uh, success. So let me just get right into it, uh, and let me start with you, uh, Asha. Um, just give us a brief overview of biological warfare in the world. Uh, you know, we know that chemical weapons have been used most tragically and most recently in Syria, uh, but uh, tell us more about biological weapons. Well, I... 
uh, I think from a historical perspective, it's important to remember that biological weapons are not something new that suddenly popped up in the last you know, decade or even in the last uh, century. Um, we, uh, we actually did some research for a, a, a graphic novel we did on germ warfare and found that, you know, there's evidence of Scythian archers back in 300 BC dipping their arrows into blood and dung and intentionally shooting those um, at their enemy forces. So I bring that up because as we as we as we go forward, there are two paths when it comes to uh, biological weapons. One is this low tech version, uh, where anybody can collect anything and and you know engage in the kind of uh, uh, warfare or attack that just has to do with um, you know foodborne illness and and uh, th that direct uh, introduction of a disease into somebody with this kind of carrier. But otherwise, you're looking at high tech, high military uh, sort of applications uh, with World War One and the Germans engaging in their program, World War Two, and the Japanese engaging in a pretty significant uh, program. You know, fast forwarding to the 1990s when uh, Iraq uh, was weaponizing anthrax and putting it into Scud missiles. Um, the anthrax events of 2001, of course. So you can see there's that low tech and then there's this high tech version. Um, we have our biological weapons and toxin uh, convention in place. Various countries say they're not doing it and others say that they're not doing it either, but they're still engaged. Um, so, so this is basically the history and we ought not be surprised uh, when somebody comes up with another uh, more evidence of a biological program occurring in a place like North Korea or Russia. Right. And she did mention the Biological Weapons Convention, so we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, Jessica, let me turn to you. Uh, we know that in that family of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons are just the absolute weapon. There's a reason why we call them that way. They're the most terrifying. They're the most destructive. Um, chemical weapons can kill a lot of uh, people, too. But um, biological weapons uh, are far more dangerous. Just tell us briefly why. Great, thank you. Yeah, they are dangerous. So whether natural, intentional, or accidental, um, they're certainly on the rise and they're growing faster than governments, health systems, security technology, and importantly, policies can keep up. Uh, the danger around bio threats is that they can persist. And unlike chemical weapons, they propagate and spread through a population unnoticed for days before symptoms appear. These threats, again, while naturally occurring or deliberately created are increasing, I think, for several reasons. Um, they're magnified by rapidly changing an interconnected world. Uh, there's increasing political instability and urbanization. And then um, to Asha's point, the rapid technology advances that makes it easier and cheaper and faster to create and engineer pathogens. I think what we're seeing right now with the COVID-19 outbreak is we're in the midst of a devastating pandemic. I mean, we're nearing a million cases and over 50,000 deaths. 10% uh, of those confirmed and reported cases are in the Middle East and all from a naturally occurring novel coronavirus that you, that you mentioned earlier. So we haven't seen an outbreak like this of a respiratory virus since 1918. Um, and I, I, I think there have been warnings I know there have been warnings from our public health and our health security communities that a situation like this would not could happen. And so there's a need for greater preparedness and cooperation that's becoming even more fundamental to the conversation. Um, as I mentioned, these risks are exacerbated by global travel and trade and, and lack of pandemic preparedness capability, both that we're seeing right now and the dependence on a suite of interconnected essential services. So you're looking at power, water, food, healthcare is a critical component, telecommunications, and then taxing on our global financial system. So when you look at that as a whole, I think the same scientific advances that help fight epidemic disease also have allowed pathogens to be engineered and recreated in laboratories. So it's easier to manipulate certain pathogens. And then in parallel, you still have legitimate scientific research that continues to be conducted. Sometimes these experiments um, also involve the creation and enhancement of pathogens with pandemic potential. And then finally, you also have this category of laboratory accidents and errors that demonstrate 
this profound need to proactively identify risks and guard against the accidental accidental releases. Um, so I, I think to an earlier point, I think it's important to increase the, the political will for accelerating health security and not be caught in this perpetual cycle that we've heard of surprise and, and complacency. And I think when it comes to bio threats, there have been various external assessments of countries' preparedness and they've been fairly consistent in that more needs to be done and, and really no country is prepared. So I think, I think what we're seeing right now is there's an opportunity for countries to show national leadership and, and regions to increase cooperation. Right. That's excellent. Uh, Hen, um, I think Asha has already alluded to it, but I mean, to my knowledge, to your knowledge, there hasn't been any use of biological weapons throughout the history of the Middle East. Uh, but just Give us your own assessment of uh, the likely risks of some of these bad actors, whether it's the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda, uh, Al -Qaeda, having uh, access to these weapons and using them. How do you also see, you know, the, uh, the biosafety measures and biosecurity measures in the region? Thank you. Thank you, Bilal and MEI, for organizing this uh, very timely event, obviously. And... Uh, when we speak about the threat in the region, let me go through three different kinds, uh, bioweapons, by state, bioterrorism, or the use of, uh, the use of bio aspect of that as a, the terrorism, as well as pandemic. And, and those are the three levels of threats that we really witness in the region and, and as well as the Cape dealt with them for over um, many, many years. As Asha said, this is really not a new threat. Uh, on the biological weapon side, so at least one country uh, in the region had very extensive biological weapons uh, stockpiles and, and weapons, and that's Iraq. And uh, from started from 1973 until 1991, and following the Gulf War, because of the establishment of UNSCOM, the United States Special Commission uh, Inspection Team, that revealed the program and verified and then dismantled it. Um, but Iraq, during that process of dismantlement, admitted that they had weaponized a biological weapon agent in a warhead, bombs, airdrop, tanks, and aerosol generators. And I'm saying all of that in the sense of they really explore many areas of how does we this weapon can be used. Other countries in the region also are suspected or speculated to have nuclear, uh, sorry, we biological weapons. Um, and th those countries are including uh, Iran, Syria, Libya, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. But again, I'm saying speculation because we really don't have evidence for those. So I would not uh, go beyond, beyond this uh, title of speculation or assumption. Um, there is also though measures to address biological weapon. And uh, I think Asha already mentioned the biological weapon convention. Uh, in the region, most countries are part of it, of the Biological Weapon Convention, and the, and the, the convention practically said that it prohibits the transfer or uh, of developing or assisting others from acquiring biological weapon. And th there are countries in the region that most of them are party to this treaty, but some of them are signed and not ratified, which is Egypt, Somalia, and Syria, and then another three didn't ratify or sign, which is a Comoros, Djibouti, and Israel. So participation, even in the international global level of measures are lacking. Uh, and there are there have been many, many efforts by uh, the UN, by the EU, and other others to get those countries to sign and ratify, but with no success so far. OK. Um, but so, just, just uh, no, sorry, just for the general audience, so just uh, tell us the difference between signature and ratification, because obviously it's a big uh, distinction. So signature means that you are not legally obligated by the rule of the treaty, but you politically committed not to violate it. Okay. No, but ratification is the already the legal requirement that actually you are as a country also legally required to obey by the treaty. Right. I think a ratification in our context, like when we have to go to the Senate to ratify a certain arms control treaty, right? And uh, at that point, it becomes legally binding. Okay. Was there anything else you wanted to add uh, before I move on to Jessica? You just asked about bioterrorism. So if uh, we want to cover that part, so practically, as you mentioned, I think Al-Qaeda did so to, to acquire a biological weapon. And ISIS, we had several evidence that we found that uh, they were interested or plotted to have uh, to try to exercise biological weapon attack in different countries in the region. 
Okay. Uh, Jessica, uh, Hannes talked about, uh, you know, the Middle East not being in perfect standing as far as the BWC, but also not in horrible standing, right, uh, compared to others. But just very briefly, because it's such an important uh, regime or construct to try to stem the proliferation of biological weapons, tell us what are some of the main uh, challenges uh, dogging this uh, organization now, at least globally speaking? Great. Yeah, so um, I'll go back to um, a report that the Nuclear Threat Initiative put out in October of 2019. So we developed the Global Health Security Index in, in, in partnership with the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And in doing that, we looked at 195 countries, and it essentially was a comprehensive assessment and benchmarking of health security. I raise that because a component of that index was focused on the biological um, toxins and weapons convention. And so our index relied entirely on open source information. So data that a country had published on its own or reported or been reported to by an international entity. And in general compliance with the BWC was um, across the board, at least for Middle Eastern countries, it was um, like the, the um, signatory and the ratification that, that we just discussed, almost all countries in the Middle East have done so. But the challenges here is that with compliance reporting, the main issue is that it's not necessarily mandatory, it's not universally done by state's party, and the quality varies across the reporting. So um, confidence building measures are great and it's a measure of transparency, but it varies across the board. I would also say that there's, um, there's a lot of conversation going on around confidence building measures and whether they should be required or universally imp implemented or whether having training and assistance with completing those confidence building measures is more beneficial to the group writ large. Okay, um, Asha, let's go back, uh, Asha, let's go back to um, COVID-19, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you could just Describe to us briefly uh, the current uh, international cooperation and uh, what uh, what could you tell us about um, also biological threats and proliferation as we assess that kind of cooperation? Well, I mean, I think we, we're, we're all very aware of what's happening in terms of individual countries trying to address COVID-19. Uh, I refer to this as the pell-mell phase of pandemic response or epidemic response. Everybody's just sort of tripping all over themselves, trying to get to a vaccine, trying to contain spread and so forth. It's very disorganized. And uh, during any kind of response to anything, when you're, the more you're, the more disorganized you are, the more resources you draw down, the more inefficient you are. Um, so this has direct implications then for the ability of a country to coordinate, uh, collaborate with anybody else. If you're just constantly taken up um, trying to respond and never look outside to see what else somebody else may be doing, how else you could coordinate, um, how you can take advantage of their science, uh, then you kind of have what we have right now, which, which we're seeing everywhere, including here, uh, you know, in the United States. Um, but, you know, there's this strain, obviously, that's being put on the healthcare and public health critical infrastructure sector here in the United States and elsewhere. When you have that, uh, obviously, you begin to see uh, the, the vulnerability that's, um, that's usually there, uh, but that many of us ignore because we experience high levels of health uh, anyhow in, in countries that have good health care and uh, a public health infrastructure or some reasonable sense, uh, amount of that. So we have to be con concerned because when it comes to proliferation, uh, people don't proliferate weapons just for the sake of it. People proliferate and decide to, to produce a weapon and then proliferate it because they view um, a weakness, a vulnerability on the part of some other country uh, or some other region. And they're looking to exploit that. This COVID-19 pandemic shows us more than, you know, H1N1 and a number of other global uh, disease events that we've seen. It, it's really a, a very valuable test case. Um, anybody looking to engage in a biological weapons program can see how we're responding um, and how, how well or how poorly people are uh, coordinating amongst each other. Um, I think that we have to 
remember this and take into account that this pandemic nature of, of disease, it doesn't make sense for there to have there to be a global problem that all of these countries are trying to uh, address individually. Uh, the more we can regionalize and globalize our response, uh, the better off we'll be. And I also believe that if we do that, then um, the concern about proliferation and actual proliferation should uh, de decrease as well. But we're not there right now. Okay, perfect. Uh, and same question to you, but now let's turn to the region. Uh, I have seen some reports about uh, examples of cooperation, but also lack of cooperation, whether it's amongst Arabs or between Israel and uh, the Palestinians. Just give us a good uh, overview of what's going on right now in terms of cooperation in the region. Let me start just with a couple of points that I think what happened in the region is not unique to what happened right now uh, globally. I think there are some unique twists to it, but I think that some of the characteristics that we see in the region are very, very similar to what we see uh, everywhere else. The other part is that I will not rely on the numbers that are being published in the region or outside the region by most countries for several reasons. One is that testing is very <laughs> So some countries testing as many as they can, some of them not testing at all. And some countries don't want to inflate, num or not inflate, but say as many, uh, what, how many there are just uh, because, and, and this is, is relevant to the region for uh, stability, reason of stability and, and regime. Uh, the other part that I will say is that what I, my observation is now as are as of today and things are changing very fast. And we are right now in the relatively first phase of the pandemic, we will have other waves and other, and, and some of those aspects might change over time. So first, let me start with the observation that really what we see right now is the national state won in many ways, or the reemergence of the strong uh, national state as opposed to multilateralism and cooperation. And it's unfortunate, but that's how we see it right now because of the unique characterization of the virus, which is very deadly enough that uh, you cannot really let it spread, but transmissional enough that it spread rapidly, uh, but in which countries that really uh, showed uh, extreme measure of suppression and, and in the sense of uh, self-isolation and other, and ban of travel, uh, et cetera, uh, the only countries can enact those. And uh, international organization can recommend uh, they, but the fact that only states can enact those really uh, enforce the power of state uh, right now. Uh, so for international organizations such as the UN or others, uh, they have been so far, and again, I'm saying so far, relatively silent and also ineffective because they cannot uh, enact those uh, measures. Uh, also relatedly uh, in the region, uh, what we see is uh, sectarianism and really the, the fact that we don't see hardly at all cooperation. Where do we see the cooperation is uh, in the GCC countries uh, willing to help Iran to some extent, and really, and some of them actually uh, allow the HDO uh, to get some uh, supply and help. We also see relatively very strong cooperation between uh, the Israelis and Palestinians and also the Hamas because of the fear of the transboundary aspect of that and the fact that um, there is no way to really uh, block transmission. So there is cooperation, it's very limited. It's limited to the coronavirus and the, and the aspects of really trying to prevent spread. Perfect, okay. Uh, Asha, before I turn to you and uh, uh, talk about the um, Biodefense Commission, uh, Jessica, uh, could you uh, talk to us a little bit about the uh, very important index that you guys are working on uh, at NTI? The, what is it called? The Global Health Security Index? Uh, tell us yeah, how does that so relate the, to uh, the COVID-19 situation. Great. So the Global Health Security Index, which was published in October of 2019, outlines six key categories that relate to health security. So the prevention, detection, and response to an outbreak. It looks at health systems. So a health system, access to healthcare, healthcare workers are a foundational element and a response and, and honestly in the preparedness of an outbreak. And then it also looks at geopolitical concerns and, and commitments to national capacity and financing. 
And so what we did with this index was ask essentially 140 questions around these categories of publicly available data for each country, and then identified what the gaps were in health security. And so what we found in general was that there were weaknesses across the board. Um, out of a score of zero to 100, the average score across all countries is a 40.2. When you looked at health system specifically, it was a 26.2. And so there are weaknesses across the board. I think as it relates to the outbreak right now, we're seeing that health system component really playing a strong role in the ability for the community to respond and respond in a way to address all of the cases that are now being presented and in protecting our healthcare workforce. Is the, uh, and I was gonna take questions at the very end, but this is just so relevant to what you just said. Is the index available in any other languages, specifically in Arabic? This is one question from the audience. Yeah, great. So right now the GHS index is available in English only. We're working through um, translations of all UN languages or of the main UN languages, and we should have those posted here in the near future. Got it, okay. So thank it's you in very the much. Work. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Asha, uh, Biodefense Commission. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it is bipartisan, right? It is. Okay, so nowadays it sounds like a unicorn. So uh, <laughs> tell us about this commission. Why is it important? I know you served as the executive director and uh, tell us uh, if it offers any lessons or if anything applies to uh, the Middle East at least. Sure. So the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense is a private sector entity, so we don't receive any government funding. Um, and we operate as if we are congressionally mandated, but we do not have a mandate from Congress. Um, we just follow the same example uh, that was set by other commissions like the 9-11 Commission, the WMD Commission, and many, many other commissions we've had here in the United States. Um, we, we use the same kind of methodology where we run all day meetings, uh, very similar to congressional hearings. We um, get information from uh, you know, our speakers and others, we conduct research, and then we produce recommendations. Um, we do take those recommendations to Capitol Hill, to Congress. We also take them to the administration. And where uh, applicable, we also communicate those recommendations to the private sector. Um, so in terms of applicability, obviously, you know, we're like many other entities in Washington, D.C. We like to spit out our reports with many, many recommendations. But um, our first report was issued in 2015. It and it was called a National Blueprint for Biodefense. It contains 33 recommendations that address biodefense across the entire spectrum. So not just healthcare and public health, but also uh, prevention, deterrence, preparedness, surveillance, detection, response, attribution, recovery, and mitigation. Um, and I, I wanna just take a second to talk about that last word. Um, my staff will tell you that I'm all constantly correcting their use of the word mitigation to just mean reduction. Um, I, I get that that's what it means in English uh, as well, but when we're talking about mitigation, we are talking about what you do after an event to strengthen the ability of a country to be able to deal with a, a, the same sort of event or a biological event in this case in the future so that the impacts are much less than they would be otherwise. Uh, we see it a lot in emergency management, for example, with earthquakes. After you have an earthquake, you don't go back and build everything to the same code that, that it was before. You build it to an earthquake code so that once you have another earthquake, it's not quite as bad. This is the same uh, with us. So that little lecture aside, um, in terms of applicability of our recommendations to other countries, our recommendations uh, are, are certainly applicable elsewhere. But I think that when you look at our reports, what you'll see is a focus on the United States. Um, and we get very, very specific in terms of what the government should be doing and how it should be doing it. So if somebody from another country picks up one of our reports, they're going to see, for example, that um, we recommended, our top recommendation was that the Vice President of the United States be put in charge of 
the biodefense enterprise. Why? Because we have so many departments and agencies that are involved. It's a whole government kind of thing. And one department, in this case, the Department of Health and Human Services, cannot tell all the other departments what to do. And it becomes a big mess. And you need somebody at a high level that is empowered by the president to gather everybody up and force everybody to go in a particular direction. That is a uh, certainly a recommendation in spirit that can be applied elsewhere, but not everybody has a, has a president and a vice president. They have prime ministers and other forms of government. Similarly, we recommended an interagency coordination committee. We recommended uh, the national biodefense strategy. We also recommend that um, each country, our country, uh, understand how much money it's spending uh, and on what uh, when it comes to biodefense. All of those and our other, you know, 29 recommendations are applicable, um, but you'd have to take them and uh, tailor them to, to each country. Uh, and don't focus entirely, just as we don't focus entirely, on just the healthcare and the public health system. There's so much more to it, as we're seeing right now with the intelligence community, with the defense community, and so forth. Um, it's just a question of taking what we have done for the United States and applying it in a specific, um, you know, environment with another country or region. Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jessica, uh, a good bit has been said about the BWC. Uh, it is probably the most important construct regime to stem the proliferation of uh, biological weapons, uh, but is there anything else that we're missing here in this conversation, uh, US or global mechanisms, approaches that could also help in that regard? Yeah, so I think even under the BWC, there's there are opportunities there to gain greater awareness and, and transparency across the board. I think one idea that seems to be getting traction is um, a more formal and funded mechanism for getting advice about science and technology developments relevant to the BWC. Uh, state parties have put forward various proposals about a science and technology advisory body or group. Um, so it's a similar model to the Chemical Weapons Convention, and there's, there's a potential chance that, that they'd be able to reach arrangement on that agreement, um, perhaps in the, next, in the coming years. Um, I also think that as far as um, having a mechanism um, for investigating the source of a biological event, so when the international community is unsure whether something is naturally caused or accidentally re released or, or even a deliberate event, it'd be nice to have something that's perhaps one step below a full-blown UN Secretary General mechanism for investigation, but also as expansive from um, then the World Health Organization public health investigation. So having something like a joint assessment mechanism under that paradigm could be, could be helpful. And then lastly, I think outside of the BWC, um, and, and I think this is something that we're seeing play out now, is that communication and that politi political leadership so having larger, um, whether it be regional organizations or, or even more global, take a stronger stance as it relates to bio threats, I think that's critical. You know, we've seen recently um, Saudi Arabia is the, the president of the G20 for 2020, and we saw a statement come out recently and a commitment towards addressing biological threats in the, the, in the current environment with COVID-19. And I think that's going to play a critical role, not only in the rapid response, like from a financing perspective of response to COVID-19, but also for longer term preparedness, which is so key to having these, again, these fundamental underlying um, systems that allow for better preparedness. Right. Uh, I'd hate to miss this question because it's just so relevant uh, to what you just said, but uh, one of the audience members says, um, could you just tell us very briefly, um, what are the main, like one or two successes and failures or flaws in the BWC? I mean, I suspect I know what the flaws are, but just can you just tell us very briefly, uh, if you were to brief, say, uh, the president of the United States and tell him, here's what, what I really like about the BWC, and here's what's sort of more like a liability or vulnerability, what would those be? Just one or two. Yeah, I think one of the biggest criticisms is that enforcement piece. Right. So uh, unlike other other um, conventions, like having the teeth 
on actually enforcing something and then bringing to to bear actual actions falling on that. I'd say that's that's the biggest criticism. Okay, uh, and this is something that you've studied for quite a while uh, throughout your career, and you've promoted a good bit in writing and in uh, speeches, which is this idea or concept of a weapons of mass destruction uh, free zone. You're also working on that project with the uh, UNIDIR. Uh, okay, maybe it won't happen in my lifetime, maybe not in yours, maybe not in anybody's on this panel, but um, is, is there a more realistic uh, uh, opportunity here for at least I mean, at one point we were also talking about a, just a chemical weapons free zone, but since we're talking about bio today, is there an opportunity, is there some kind of momentum for at least creating that part of the concept or is still we're too far from that is still a pipe dream? But for the audience in general, just tell us more about, you know, when did this idea originate, uh, who took ownership of its leadership, uh, and, um, and now at what stage are we in that process? So the Middle East weapon of mass destruction free zone is an idea that practically is around uh, for yet again uh, many, many years, since practically 1974. Uh, it started with initiative both with Iran and Egypt. Um, it started actually as a nuclear weapon free zone. And then in the 90s, because of uh, the discovery of the Iraqi biological and chemical side of the nuclear uh, weapons program, uh, it was expanded by uh, President Mubarak of Egypt from uh, only nuclear weapon free zone to a weapon of mass destruction free zone, as well as ballistic missiles or means of deliveries. Um, so it's really an all encompassing uh, initiative, and it really speaks about the concerns of countries in the region about proliferation in the region. Uh, but as I mentioned, while it is a very long term idea in the making uh, progress, and as you mentioned, Bilal as well, has not been uh, much. And, and the, the main reason for, for this lack of progress is the strategic and regional realities that continue to really uh, impede even speaking about it in a dialogue and in, a, in, in negotiations. There is right now a, a process that started at the UN, but uh, which most countries in the region are participating uh, Israel is not participating in that process. Um, they also, um, there is, if I'm looking realistically, when which aspect can be expanded on when we speak about all those kinds of weapon of mass destruction in the region, actually biological weapons in many times uh, was considered the low ending fruits actually, because there is some agreement in the region, there is some consensus in the region both about the threat, as well as the limited military utility of biological weapon. And there is also some, uh, there is also huge understanding uh, about the threat posed by non-state actor, actual acquisition of such an, a, a weapon, as well as the potential use of it. So there is also um, some cooperation on uh, biosecurity and biosafety and pandemic prevention and monitoring. So the, actually the bio aspects and not only bio weapon, but also biosecurity and biosafety actually are relatively the easier uh, part to uh, build upon if we want to uh, really look on this big dream of weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East and how we can think about how we can operationalize it. And when we speak about how we can operationalize it and we speak only in the biological weapon aspects, there are four pillars that we will have to think about in the region, in the regional context. The first is that, that it needs to address the prevention of uh, acquisition and use of biological weapon by both state and non-state actors. And if we speak about the biological weapon convention, again, as, as every other convention, it's related to state, but the question in the region especially is how we address non-state actors and how we address that threat. Another one is the uh, response and mitigation, or as Asha like to get it, to say to it, uh, <laughs> reduction in the event of bio biological weapon attack. Uh, another aspect that that's exactly what uh, Jessica spoke about in the global, but we need also to speak about it in the regional uh, context is enforcement of international uh, law standards, uh, code of conduct, uh, that in order to prevent uh, acquisition development or use of biological weapon. And the, third, the fourth one is cooperation on peaceful uses, a legitimate biological uh, research. 
Uh, and then really this is something that will continue and should continue. And it's very important. The only risk of course, in, and this is relevant to all the other weapon of mass destruction is the dual use nature of those technologies and all those aspects and how we make sure that uh, legitimate uses are not being used uh, or misused for weapon purposes. And uh, in addition to what Jessica mentioned about enforcement, one of the problems that we have in the biological realm is verification. It's very, very hard to distinguish between legitimate to non-legitimate uh, research and products unless they are weaponized and that's too late. Okay. Uh, I would like to turn to some of the questions that we're receiving here and there are quite a few. Um, and uh, what I'll do is just read uh, each one and then it's up to you guys, whoever wants to take them. But uh, I'm gonna suspect the first one will probably go to you, Hen, uh, which I actually like, uh, obviously is dependent on so many variables, but it's um, very curious in your take. Uh, which Middle Eastern government do you think is best prepared for a pandemic? I mean, I'm sure it has to do with organizational capacity and whatever Asha was talking about before in terms of not just uh, belief, but also awareness. Uh, so just in your, your own guess, which Middle Eastern government is best prepared for a pandemic? So I would not try actually to guess because I think there are several problems that are irrelevant almost that if they were prepared or not prepared. And this is part of what Asha said, the belief. Some of them just delayed even if they were prepared and even if they had plans, they some, some countries in the region delayed uh, response and very aggressive response because they were all thinking that it's not going to get them or because they thought it's going to be resolved and addressed in other ways. And- I thought we so, did that too, but okay. I'm thinking about the Middle East. <laughs> I'm not getting anywhere else right now. Okay. So I, even if the fact that there was a preparedness and apparatus and organizational and institutional capabilities, that doesn't mean the decision makers made the real hard decisions that were required because of sometimes religious reasons. Some of them did it because of uh, uh, foreign policy reasons. And, and so I will not uh, be able to answer it and we can do all the research later on about what the right response and not right response were. But I can say that at least if you look on so both Saudi Arabia and Israel, did very early, very strong responses about travel, banning travels and not, uh, uh, not uh, allowing people to uh, be in the streets really late at night or outside our specific hours, while others did not take uh, as many as such extreme measure really early. On the other end, testing, if you look, for example, in some of Gulf countries, they're doing testing much more widely and have the capacity to do those testing as opposed to other countries that do not do testing because they don't have as many. So size of a country also have a big influence of their ability to actually test uh, more widely. Okay. Asha, let me ask you to put on your academic hat for a second and try to resurrect your knowledge sure. of deterrence uh, studies. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question about uh, what role does the strategy of deterrence play in uh, deterring um, not just the possession, but also the use of biological weapons, should those be possessed by, let's just say, a terrorist organization or another rogue you know, actor. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on the role of deterrence in this? Well, you know, of course the challenge is when you look at um, uh, the this, this sort of deterrence strategy that we've uh, experienced with nuclear and chemical weapons, um, we hope that some of that applies when it comes to bio, but you know, the, the, the problem immediately comes to uh, what, what Hen and Jessica have mentioned in the way of dual use technology. We're just like immediately there and you don't want to deter um, engaging in legitimate biological research. Uh, you know, a great example right now has to do with uh, vaccine development. The same equipment that helps you generate vaccine is what you would use to generate a biological weapon using a virus, um, uh, you know, subsequently. And it can be turned very, very quickly. So um, I would just say from an academic standpoint, 
Deterrence theory um, can, can apply to a certain extent, but I think that that is limited. And I think in this particular arena, from an academic perspective, we, we actually need to go ahead and take this out of the too hard to address box and um, address it and address it now uh, before we have um, you know, additional proliferation and wind up trying to um, deter, deter actual use as opposed to development in the first place. I know that's kind of a wimpy answer, but. No, no, I uh, actually appreciate it. Uh, Jessica, uh, unless you want to add anything to deterrence, there was a question specifically for you uh, on the uh, index. So given the fact that the United States has the highest score on the index, right, whether it's, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, 83.5, that's what I mm -hmm. just read uh, from the questions. But also the fact that it seems to have uh, the highest score of uh, COVID-19 cases, does that mean that the index score is actually inaccurate or it's a little bit more complicated than that? I love this question. It, 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 it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but to boil it down, it, it really comes down to um, the emergency response plans and exercising that the U.S. has, um, which the US, that was one of the U.S.'s lowest scores. Um, in looking at uh, uh, political, um, well, confidence and political leadership, uh, we had, we, the U.S. had a very low score. Um, looking at access to healthcare, government healthcare services, and again, another really low score for the United States. So I think when we're looking at this as far as like in an, in an active outbreak where we are, it, it's not totally surprising that the U.S. is where it is. Um, we did, the U.S. did score the highest. Again, it was an 83.5, so it was a pretty flat B. Um, not great, not great at all. Um, it was with the rest of the globe when it looks at um, health systems and the score for the health systems. It was in the 70s, so also not a great score. Um, so great question. Uh, this one will go for anyone who wants to take it. Um, are any of these countries falsifying their numbers as far as, you know, COVID-19 cases? And, I mean, you would suspect that there might be some interest in doing that just to you know, look good and right and see that they, actually, they have the situation under control. But um, uh, if anybody would like to take that one, um, uh, Asha, maybe? Well, I, d I don't know that we could prove that anybody right. is intentionally um, misreporting. And on top of that, um, as was mentioned earlier, we have a reporting problem anyway, even if you want to be totally honest and um, right. So uh, I guess that's a better question. It. Like, do we have any mechanisms to, to certify or to verify uh, whether countries are actually falsifying their numbers? I mean, we, we just don't. We don't have access, right? We don't have access, but I, I think that there are, you know, we're, we're all analysts and uh, we should be drawing upon a lot of different sources of information and not just one, which would be, you know, a country's report of cases and deaths to the WHO. Um, if a country is, for example, reporting, uh, you know, whatever they're reporting, um, but at the same time, the press is showing and people are talking about the huge numbers of, of people who are dying and morgue facilities being you know, put up temporarily. Um, and you're looking at that and you can see, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of maybe thousands of people are dying, but at the same time, the country is reporting something that does not seem to fit with that. Then um, there's something possibly, probably intentional going on there. Uh, but even then, it's difficult to talk about, you know, what the motivation is. I mean, do any of us really care if um, China is underreporting cases? It's still reporting a huge number of cases, and we're sort of taken up with what's happening here in the United States anyway. It would be nice if, in a perfect world, everybody was reporting perfectly, um, just because it would help everybody else to manage this disease and its spread, and we could understand it better. Um, but otherwise, I think this is the imperfect nature of pandemic reporting. I mean, I'm just reporting. thinking about this, like beyond international sympathy, but wouldn't you be motivated to report more accurately because you might be receiving more international assistance and attention? I, I think it depends on the culture. 
you know, right. the culture of the org of, of, of the country, the trust that they have in international assistance anyway, and their ability to to see what's happening. It's not like, you know, I'm not aware of any country that has so many ex extra resources available to send anywhere else anyhow. Uh, right. But I, I really do think it comes down to culture and it comes down to, you know, perhaps even larger um, socio-political considerations right. Right. that we're not aware of. Yeah, let me tie the issue of culture and to uh, just the overall system of governance, right? So, for example, I'll take the example of um, Syria, where hundreds of cases and thousands of cases were being reported uh, in the neighborhood of Syria, whether it's Lebanon, Jordan, other places. And all of a sudden, Syria would announce that, haha, we have the first single case of coronavirus in the country. I'm going to take a wild guess that your confidence level in the reporting of the Syrian regime is not very high, right? So, um, why would the Syrian regime do that? Is it inextricably tied to the level of democratization and, you know, as Asha was saying, the political culture of the country? What else is there uh, to uh, uh, look at, to examine, to try to better understand a certain countries' uh, reporting and um, response to the crisis? So, first of it is. Uh usually countries try to hide or not publish at least failures. And nobody wants to publish failure of entire health system and collapse of the entire health system, as well as um, ability to respond to something that you saw already coming for the last two months. So in, in countries that obviously the media is not as open, ability to report out from the country is not as easy by social media, this is where you will see less reporting on cases and maybe also a country is the regime itself trying to uh, hide numbers or at least not uh, reveal all the information they have. But in countries like Yemen, like Syria, like uh, several other in the region, they're in the midst of a civil war. People are dying anyhow. So the ability to distinguish what and the reason people exactly died from in a system that already the government already is in a collapse situation in a country that the ability to monitor to report is already bad i i would not even put it as a honest on them i would not expect them even to do it just because i think they're incapable with other priorities they're dealing with other priorities as well as the level of a uh, public health in such a dear situation that uh, who is going to report and to whom right Right, right. Uh, unless you have other thoughts on this, uh, Jessica, there was a question also about the BWC. Um, I know that we mentioned what, uh, you know, roles and responsibilities the BWC plays that could be relevant to the current situation, but is there any specific legal role that the organization now is currently playing or you would like it to play with regard to COVID-19? That's what that was one of the questions. Mm -hmm. So I think just given that this is a, a naturally occurring uh, virus, it, it wasn't yeah. deliberately created. And in fact, just recently there were reports um, that have been written in nature outlining why, like the justification as to, or rationale rather, as to why it is naturally occurring. So I think the BWC's role there isn't as direct. It's more of like, a, an observation as far as outcome and response right. um, rather than a direct role to play. Would you prefer that it would broaden the mandate or at that point, no, it becomes less and less relevant? Um, that's sorry, a good sorry question. to put you on the you know, spot. Yeah, I think the World Health Organization's role as it relates to um, the response to an epidemic or a pandemic is strong. I think when you look at any organization, whether it's the WHO or it's the BWC, the issue is on resource constraints. And so where we are right now, there is no one organization that's able to address this as expeditiously as we would like them to do. Um, so as far as broadening the, um, the, the principles by which the BWC like looks at an outbreak, I don't know if it would I almost think it would probably complicate the situation rather than be a solution. Got it. Okay. Uh, this is um, less of a question, more like a, um, 
a statement of fact, I guess. Uh, during the Iran-Iraq War, um, uh, there were uses of sort of World War One, like you know, mustard gas um, and anthrax. Uh, so that was uh, an intervention by one of the audience members. Uh, Han, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. So I, I think the refer the reference is the use of chemical weapon during the Iran-Iraq War and the fact that Iraq or Saddam Hussein use uh, chemical weapons against uh, Iran, as well as against uh, his own citizen, the Kurdish uh, population in Halabja. Uh, I just want to emphasize it was chemical weapon. There were some uh, rumors of biological weapon uh, use as well, but those were never confirmed. Um, so I'm just putting it out there as in the sense that they were not confirmed. In fact, uh, there was some investigation that could not confirm them. So I will not, but it's easy to not distinguish between chemical and biological weapon. In that case, it was chemical weapon. Got it. Okay. Uh, let me throw a grenade here, which is a, a very interesting question, but uh, I have no clue how to answer myself. So uh, whoever wants to take it. Uh, what is the potential threat of a biological attack uh, instituted by cyber attack? So basically triggered through cyber means. Anyway. <laughs> well, I, I think that these two things are certainly uh, tied. Our, our commission thinks that, uh, well, perhaps not tied, but there's certainly an interaction between cyber and bio. Um, you know, it depends on what cyber aspect we're talking about, but already um, WHO has reported many, many attempts to hack their data systems uh, already. Um, and certainly in our country, uh, we've seen cyber attacks on, on hospitals and healthcare uh, insurance companies looking, you know, actually basically just to access data. Um, I, I think that beyond that, you, you start getting into the realms of, of, of science fiction and the, co the combination of cyber and bio, uh, you know, nanotechnology with, um, you know, human tissue on it and, and, and all of that. I don't think uh, right now the risk is uh, particularly high, but I do think that um, it's, it bears monitoring as we go, as we go forward. Um, you know, I doubt that um, if you're going to have another biological attack right now, somebody were to, to engage in a biological attack, it's, it's pretty unlikely that it's going to just be um, uh, something similar to COVID-19. It's probably going to be something different, but it's still probably not going to just be purely bio. I think where, where you can combine bio with something else, it becomes a more efficient um, weapon, possibly. But we're theorizing, really. Got it. Okay, uh, the final three minutes of this. Uh, I want to give you all um, the opportunity to say uh, any final words. But also, I want to give a huge shout out to one specific audience member who's pretty much asked 17 questions by herself. I'm exaggerating, but several. And that's uh, Rubina Ali. Hi, Rubina. I don't know you, but thank you so much for being so engaged and active. And I hope we at least answered one or two of your questions. I got the one on the turn, so there you go. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, let me turn to you, Jessica, then Hen, and then conclude with Asha with some uh, final thoughts, please. Great, thanks. Um, so my final, final thoughts would be that, that health security certainly is global, but it starts local. And so in having the engagement at the local level is really, really critical. Um, we at NTI in partnership with Georgetown University and the Center for Global Development have recently released a covidlocal.org. Um, it's meant to be essentially a checklist for local leaders and to help them manage this response for COVID-19. We recognize that the uh, risk communication and the guidance that's coming out especially in a place like the United States, where it's a bit more of a patchwork system with our states, is becoming more and more critical. And I think this is something that can be tailored to other communities outside of the U.S. So um, I just want to let folks know that's out there. Um, it's certainly a resource, and I'm happy to answer more about that. But when it comes to any kind of um, regional or, or local response, those local leaders are really a key to getting out to um, populations that are not only just in dense city centers, but the rural populations, which are so important as well. So thank thanks you, for Jessica. having me.
Thank you. And thank you for being so accessible and all the roles that you're playing right now to uh, try to help with this uh, very difficult situation. Hen, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so for concluding, I would just mention two points. One is that really um, the fact that some countries in the region uh, are cooperating or trying to contain some of the spread uh, is hope, give us some hope. And, and what I do hope is that they will continue to work on that and actually expand it and it will be sustainable uh, beyond the, the COVID-19 aspect. Because in the past, when uh, there was some other pandemic, uh, like the H1N1, uh, the cooperation emerged, like for example, the uh, the Middle East Consortium for Infectious Disease Surveillance, and where uh, which suffered for many, many years from lack of uh, funding. And I know NTI was funding them uh, for many years in order to support them. Uh, so the question is really how we can go from the really local and uh, very uh, limited cooperation that we see right now in COVID-19 and sustain it afterwards. Uh, the other part is that what we need to prepare really, and I think some one person asked that, is that to the second and third waves where we might see an uh, outbreak in places that we didn't see yet or they will come when the Western part uh, of uh, or Europe and the US might start recovering. And when we speak about in the Middle East is mainly the danger really is in, the, in Gaza or in the, the refugee camps and in where this, many, many displaced people are right now in the region. So they're not there, as much as we know, there are no pandemic there yet or outbreaks there yet, but we really need to start preparing for that right now and really think about it before we need to deal with a disaster, more disaster than what we already have. Okay, uh, Asha, sorry, I lied. Uh, I am going to take one final question just because I feel a little bit uh, bad for Olivia, who is especially worried about, you know, terrorist organizations acquiring these types of uh, weapons and pathogens and exploiting the current, you know, social dysfunction and uh, fear and perhaps lack of capacity to deal with this whole thing and uh, perhaps, um, you know, use those weapons uh, against societies. Uh, could, could any of you or you, Aisha, try to reassure her that, you know, the threat remains low uh, and um, uh, nothing has changed, essentially? Well, I, I don't Unless think- Unless I'm I, wrong. I, I don't think that, the, that anything has changed, but uh, w w our commission says that the, the threat has been increasing. Um, I, as I said earlier, we have to be we have to be worried about about the vulnerabilities that we're we're showing everybody. Uh, of course, all countries have demonstrated that they're just as vulnerable to COVID nineteen as everybody else. Um, but I th I think you know instead of being worried about it, what we have to do is accept that we are at biological threat for naturally occurring diseases, for accidental releases, for uh, and for, for biological weapons, biological terrorism and biological warfare. This is the way it is. We have to, we just simply have to accept it and then try and do something about it. Um, but I think, I think it is right to be um, at least somewhat concerned that, uh, you know, we're, we're in a situation where our resources are being drawn down. And from a military perspective, from a terrorist perspective, that is, in fact, when you do attack somebody else. We have to have our guard up while simultaneously trying to respond. Right. Any final thoughts, Asha? You know, I think I'll just, uh, you know, close uh, my part uh, by talking about this, this, um, this notion of awareness versus belief. Uh, I sure. know, Bilal, you asked me to talk about that before, and I, I yep. flew right by it. But, um, you know, we were talking about uh, why, why did some countries uh, hurry up and do something, you know, almost immediately once they they found out something was happening with this novel coronavirus, and others waited. Um, and and I guess my point is, and the public health community is well aware of this, that awareness and understanding and having data sitting in front of you does not automatically translate into a belief that something is going to happen or that it's going to happen to you or your country. They it just doesn't translate that way. So what we saw and are seeing with COVID-19 is the result of something that began before. This notion that um, what the data shows you doesn't necessarily mean you're, that you, while you might be aware of it, it doesn't mean that you necessarily believe it. I think what we have to do 
uh, is learn this lesson from COVID-19 and understand that that awareness is really important and somehow get ourselves socioculturally, politically, and otherwise to translate that almost immediately into belief. Because it would be better to incorrectly believe that a disease was going to affect you and your country and then sort of stand down from your, you know, your tension uh, to be ready for it, then to have the opposite, which is what many countries have suffered from, uh, not believing that that would be the case and hanging out and waiting to see whether something will actually happen to them and then suddenly having to scramble to respond. We don't have to do it that way. We should be able to, at this point in human history, take that data and say, okay, these are the implications and this is what we believe right now. So let's go ahead and take some action. That's so very well said. Thank you, Asha. Uh, well, uh, I so appreciate your expertise, all three of you, and I'm so grateful for your contributions. Uh, these are difficult times and just for you to lend us uh, your time and your expertise, it's just really very, very grateful. Uh, MEI has a wealth of information about this uh, situation as it pertains to the Middle East at least, so I really encourage you all who have participated today to take a look at that uh, wealth of information, uh, and especially those who have participated with us today. Um, and ask some really uh, tough and interesting questions. Um, once again, thank you so much. Please stay in touch, be safe, and uh, we'll see you again soon sometime. Bye-bye. Thank you.